Thank you again, all of you, for being here or online. Uh, so I'm Giuseppe Di Papa, as, uh, let me introduce again for those who just joined. Uh, today we have a Data Connect event. This is a, a community event uh, for the Platform 9. So what we like to do is to talk about this platform and uh, we will have uh, uh, three speakers, myself, and uh, Paolo Tamagnini from uh, the NIME uh, themselves, NIMER. And then uh, we'll also have somebody from industry, some with an application in the banking sector, Ivan Milan. And uh, um, so. um, yes, I have now and sure if they can hear you from the, so maybe you can speak. Should I do it closely? Yeah, maybe. Okay, maybe this is better. So, and so we'll start from uh, the academic uh, view of this, what data science machine learning platforms uh, should be, what NIME is offering. We'll have uh, the view from uh, uh, NIMER, people producing this platform. And then we'll have the view from industry, people using the platform. So that's the idea of this event. It's it's not enough uh, with uh, an hour of uh, talks to learn about the platform. So. It's important that to see how this can be a way to get uh, to inspired to use it eventually. And of course, this is not a commercial uh, event because the platform is open source and free. And so that's very important to be clear at the beginning. So let me tell you about uh, why I'm interested in, uh, in IME and how all this came to be. I was at uh, the University of Constance in Germany in 2004 when uh, the original group developing NIME was exactly from that university, so I joined them. And um, in 2006, the first uh, uh, version was released, and since then, the lot has changed. And, but when I left uh, Constance, I moved to the UK. I started to teach data science courses there. And since 2008, I used NIME for teaching data science and machine learning. So since then, I've always been in contact with the, the, the friends at NIME, and we have organized these sort of community events. Today, we'll have uh, three talks, two of which are together, because I and Paolo decided to merge them I will do the general introduction. He will do the technical introduction, more specific, because uh, since we decided to host this event here, which was a few months ago, there has been a new release of NIME that changed everything. So I thought I thought it was a, a good way to to show you the new release to have uh, somebody from NIME themselves to come here and uh, do that. So I'm uh, still adapting to the new interface, but uh, uh, I think. Uh, there are lots of interesting features we will learn today from Paolo. Uh, so the second part will be the second talk from application in the banking sector. And the third part will be more of a community sort of uh, event. So we can move to the Noisteria, the, the place, the bar and restaurant just uh, outside the, this building where we can uh, chat and share experience and opinions and drink some, uh, have some food and drink some wine if you like. So let me start with my presentation. Uh, this is something I always do also in my uh, teaching. I try, now this is more focused on NIME, but in general, I try to introduce uh, data science platforms. W what are they and uh, what do we, should we expect from them? Uh, I think it's important uh, to start from the origins of uh, what we used to call it data mining. In the late 90s, uh, from the data mining community, there was uh, this uh, idea to uh, formalize the process of uh, developing applications in terms of uh, the KDD process, the knowledge discovery in databases. So that was, uh, uh, let me say that the, the framework, the original uh, prototype of how you, be, how you do data science. And so there is this pipeline each process in the pipeline has a specific uh, task, a specific goal from the data acquisition, data cleaning, data pre-processing, uh, data preparation, data transformations, 
And finally, at the core of the pipeline, there is the machine learning algorithm, which provides uh, the, uh, the intelligence. Uh, and also data presentation. And uh, in the end, uh, with the, the last uh, layer, which in business intelligence is very important because it's actually what is given to the boss of the company to take a decision. And so we have the interpretation of the results with the representation of this knowledge, actionable knowledge possibly. But as you can see in the diagram, all these steps are, they feed back into the pipeline because it's an iterative process, refinement process to find the right, uh, the appropriate uh, workflow for your data. So to get the, the, the useful uh, results. Now, this was formalized in the late 90s. And um, in, a, in a single, single simple definition, these pl the platform, data science, machine learning platform, they have to allow you to build this pipeline. And uh, using a Gartner, uh, Gartner definition of the platform for data science and machine learning, you will see exactly a sequence of uh, uh, steps which uh, uh, correspond to the original uh, phases of the KDD process. So data access, data preparation, data exploration, visualization, uh, building analytics model, which is the machine learning step. And there is something additional, I would say. This is maybe the only difference. Here now in, uh, in modern platforms, you expect this platform to allow you to deploy the models. So to become, to, to, to put in, into practice, into action, operation, the models you have extracted from your data. And finally, they also mentioned the problem of high performance and scalability because we are in the era of big data. So it's very important to pay attention to uh, computational uh, uh, bottlenecks. So again, uh, Gartner in the latest edition, uh, I've been following Gartner view on data science for a while. This is particularly new from the last version of their analysis of this uh, sector and they don't talk about data science machine learning platforms you know they talk about multi-persona data science machine learning this additional adjective at the beginning is quite interesting it somehow um, gives credit to what we already knew in the community and i have uh, underlined these two sentences first is uh, the democratization of data science so they need to uh, give uh, uh, employees in a company the tools to do a little bit of data science, even if they don't have a computing background. So that's what they mean for this multi-persona. So there are different uh, actors in the data science uh, uh, applications. There is not just the data scientist, which uh, with the possibly a statistics background or a computer science background, but there are other people who they now do data science and they need to be involved. And uh, again, the operationalization, so deployment is a key element of these platforms. And here is some of the platforms they have included in their surveys. So this is my summary of what I've learned over the years. What do we expect from platforms, platforms for machine learning and data science? We need uh, data manipulation, data IO, data manipulation, visualization, data visualization tools, definitely, that we work with data. We need a, a system, an environment which allow us to manage the workflow, so to edit, to store, to, to do a number of activities typical of uh, uh, software management, but this time uh, on the workflow. We need the repository of machine learning algorithms because we don't want to implement anything from scratch, so we just uh, take uh, off the shelf what's available from libraries. And uh, this is very important. We need uh, the platform to allow us to do a fast prototyping. Nobody wants to wait weeks of coding to test some ideas. We need to test them in five minutes, 10 minutes. Then maybe if the idea is good and you have a promising uh, results, then you will spend uh, more time and more resources to refine the solution. So things uh, which uh, I think platforms should have, uh, they should have uh, a very advanced computational uh, um, 
facility. So they should be able to, for example, to link up with uh, um, external uh, computing infrastructures, cloud computing or other computing infrastructure so that you can test your idea on a small data set on your laptop. But then when you use uh, the big data, you can deploy the, your workflow in the cloud. And for example, in some demos I have used in the past, uh, the NIME server on Amazon uh, uh, AWS uh, services for the demonstration. So, and that's quite seamless. So it's very easy to do that. Another element which is important, we will find in NIME, of course, modularization. That's a key uh, features in programming languages. And uh, so if you can uh, uh, create levels of abstraction in your solutions, you can reuse these uh, partial solutions many times. We have also the need of a user-friendly interface that goes together to with fast prototyping and democratization of data science. Another element I think nowadays is very important is the open environment. So you don't want to be hooked up into a, a software, an environment which doesn't allow you to use external tools. You want a platform which is open to the other tools and everything can come together as a single solution. Escalability uh, for big data. And finally, of course, uh, all the previous platform here is, uh, they are not free. The only one which is open source and free at the moment is nine. So let's uh, go back to the beginning, a little bit of history of nine. First of all, the pronunciation of the name because we often get it wrong. It's nine, the silent K. And uh, the meaning of the name actually is, uh, KN is the acronym, the, the, the short for constants was a, a university project at the University of Constance, the Constance Information Miner. That's what the name means. It was um, created, developed over maybe two, three years, the University of Constance. The first release was in April uh, 2006. Actually, the public release was July, if I remember correctly. And um, nowadays we are at version 5.1 last summer. And um, there are two versions of the software so far. Maybe this will change, maybe Paolo will tell us. But there is a, the NIME Analytics platform, which is the free version, single user for your laptop. And the NIME server, which is a different software, completely different software, which can be used for large scale project, uh, uh, big uh, uh, companies with lots of employees so they can share and use uh, the server also to create uh, web services uh, and number of other applications with it. Uh, if you are interested, you want to download it, uh, it's available for all of the major operating systems. And now the academic uh, instinct, instinct kicks in. So what's exactly happening there? What's the model of programming we use in NIME? Also in other platforms similar to NIME, it's called the flow-based programming. So the general idea is you have these boxes, these units, or sometimes we like to call them components, A, B, and C. They are connected by an edge, a link with the directed edge, and the edge is actually carrying data. So Flow refers to the data flow. And uh, so the units are algorithms. They are processing units. So each unit is computing something on the input data to generate some output data, which is then propagated to other nodes. And so the processing happens uh, very naturally uh, from the uh, source node to the sync node in this uh, uh, natural flow-based uh, approach. So one node can only do the computation if the data from the previous nodes are available as input to that node. The interesting thing is uh, this is different from the programming we do in programming languages. In programming languages, we have a single flow of controls. So data will go through a single pipeline. In uh, platforms like this, data flow from the beginning to end through a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. So it's naturally parallel. 
because all paths can be executed in parallel, and they are actually. So other features in NIME, you, uh, I want to just point them quickly. Uh, it's uh, modular because we have components. Each component is an algorithm. You can combine them together, connect them together. Uh, there is a large collection of uh, uh, algorithms that you can uh, reuse. There is an integration, of lots of external libraries. For example, if you are familiar with the Weka, it's the largest repository of machine learning algorithms. Uh, it's available, it's integrated within NIME, or you can uh, access uh, a number of other libraries in any language, because also the languages are Python, uh, are integrated, JavaScript are integrated in the platform. So you can also include snippets of code in a, in a node to within uh, your workflow. The original uh, development was based uh, on Eclipse. So we, most of the computer scientists in the room or online, they are familiar with Eclipse. Eclipse is a very interesting software. I call it a fluid software. It's actually Eclipse is a, an extension engine. When you start Eclipse, there is nothing. Everything you see in Eclipse is loaded as plugin at runtime. So NIME is a set of plugins for Eclipse. Originally I said, because <laughs> Now I've, I've learned that uh, there is a transition from that uh, model of uh, software engineering to something else, which I'm still learning. Maybe Paolo will say something about it. And, um, and the, the other point I want to make is uh, very interesting. NIME was designed since the beginning to be extended. So there are a number of ways we can extend NIME. And so we, it's very interesting because then a company or uh, myself as a researcher, I create my own nine nodes, which do what I need for my particular domain. And so there is another element of, uh, we often call this, uh, the title of the talks, uh, codeless programming or uh, low level of code or, why, why this is codeless programming? Because if you look at the platform, the operation you perform, you soon realize that what you do is programming at the visual level, it's visual programming. And uh, there, is, there, there is no uh, formal proof, but uh, I'm pretty sure it shouldn't be difficult to do that. NIME is Turing complete because there are control structures, there are conditional statements, uh, variables, there is everything you need to build any software, any algorithm. So it's Turing complete, but visually, graphically. Uh, so these are a very important aspect, I think, because uh, for a computer scientist, uh, you feel a little bit uh, uh, in control if you know that you can actually do it. There is even recursion in that, although it's a bit tricky to use. <laughs> and um, so I think this is a summary of what I've already said. And the last bit uh, I want to add is there are two releases every year and I find it uh, quite reassuring. I know that in July and December, there will be a major release. And so I know that uh, those are the time where I need to sit down and look at the new features. Now I want to finish my talk uh, before I give uh, the floor to Paolo with uh, the first simplest demo so I'm gonna use the Iris dataset, what else, of course, machine learning, we have to start from that. And I'll uh, switch to NIME, the new interface, uh, which at first for people who have used the NIME for over 15 years, it's a bit uh, a nice uh, change. And uh, I will start in my local space. I can create a new, uh, workflow, or just to simplify, I will start, uh, I have one prepared already, so to make it faster, but to show you the way you can uh, interact, uh, here you have your folders of your workspace, you have some data, or you can drag and drop the data, and they will automatically be opened with the right uh, uh, component, the file reader. Once the file is loaded in main memory, it's available 
in the output port is also visualized here, the outcome of this node. It's just the data as they are. So I've already done that in this node here. Then the other nodes, you can uh, go to the repository of nodes. You search for the node you need, for example, uh, the statistics node. You can drag and drop a node like this and connect by dragging the port into the other input port and it's connected. You can uh, execute and open the view of a node. In this case, simple statistics, first order statistics of the data. And uh, the next things you do with that, because at the beginning what we do, we try to get to know the data before we apply complex machine learning out. So a scatter plot. We can uh, open a view with the scatter plot and we see two dimensions of the four dimensional data. And we realize, soon realize that there is not much to learn from this view. So we need to improve the view. How can we do that? Well, first of all, there is a class, the three species of the flowers. So we add the colors. We, add the, we can add the colors for each uh, class label here. And now we have uh, the data which has been labeled with colors. Second, since this is a multi-dimensional data, the four dimensions, we can't visualize that, right? So what I'm gonna do is dimensionality reduction. I project the four dimension into two dimension using principal component. And uh, I use this PCA node to do that, to generate two dimensions only. And finally, I can visualize with uh, a scatter plot the two dimensions I've created. And now I can actually tell that there is something going on there. So, so I can see, as we well know in machine learning about this data set, one class, the green class, is linearly separable. You can tell it's can draw a line, divide them from the other data points. The other two classes are quite uh, well defined, but there is uh, a little bit of overlap there. And now I, I, my, my next question is, uh, what, what happened to these two flowers here? Why are they located in the region which seems to be to belong to the other species? So what I like in NIME is the interactivity. So I go back to the platform, I open a view a view of the table of the data. I place it uh, somewhere here. And then uh, recall the view with the, the scatter plot. I select uh, the two flowers I'm interested in. I go back to the table and I filter the one I've selected. So they can easily interact with different views, the tables, and they are all connecting to the same platform. So that's a nice uh, little feature, which I hope they will never remove. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, in the new interface, uh, these old features of highlighting uh, permanent selection of uh, records has been uh, kept and actually the new nodes are now compatible with the old nodes. So that's very nice. So that's a quick demonstration of basic functionalities without even using any complex algorithm. So going back to my presentation to finish up, that's the demonstration I just gave. Uh, if you are interested in learning more and you are local in Bolzano, I will start a course on NIME uh, in October over six weeks. So that's organized by an organization called SMACT and uh, where we, from the university, we collaborate with them to offer uh, this type of uh, training courses. Of course, in the course there will be more and uh, I will go through the basics. So how to develop workflows, uh, starting from data manipulation, transformation, uh, cross tabulation, the basic things we need to operate on data. But then we'll move up to the basic machine learning problems like clustering, classification, regression. And, uh, and finally, we'll look also at deep learning, how to do deep learning in NIME with uh, extensions like, for example, K 
Keras uh, tensor flows are all integrated in the platform. So we can use the tensor flow within nine. So thank you very much. And now, thanks. Now, please, Paolo. So Paolo Tamagnini from NAIM uh, is uh, based in Berlin, I've learned today. Uh, he has been with NAIM for quite some time, five years at least. Yeah. Previously, you spent a uh, year at the New York University to work on uh, um, visual analytics, right? Yeah, it was uh, basically back then we were calling it machine learning interpretability. Now it's XAI, explainable AI. But it was uh, quite a year of research. But after that, I joined NIME and it was 2018, so five years since working in the evangelism team of NIME that basically is uh, the team of data scientists teaching data science using the software as well as uh, basically uh, presenting running events for the community uh, worldwide. So it's uh, it's exciting today for to be here for the Bolzano. Community. Thank you actually for coming. And yeah. Now that it's always busy schedule. Yeah. Please do start. All right, Let, let's do this. So um, let me start sharing my screen. All right, so here we are. So, um, hello. So um, you have seen the new user interface by uh, Giuseppe, right? Where you can basically starting with a workflow, you can also like um, add nodes by nodes and build your analysis, right? And, and this is like, we are seeing that there is still Java Eclipse, but it's all web-based, right? Meaning that uh, we are since, July, we moved to this new user interface, which is uh, uh, all, you know, having a fresh look and feel. Besides, you know, like uh, uh, I, we could go over all the buttons where you execute things, how you find new nodes and uh, how you save new workflow. But I would like to show you something um, interesting that is of course a big topic now in the data, data science community, right? Um, the AI, right? The AI, the possibility to use an AI to help you build those workflows. So there is here the NIME AI assistant that is uh, coming with this new version of NIME. It's part of Labs. It means that you need to install it additionally. You would need to go to uh, information here and install new extension. Uh, what is it? Here, right here, right? And here you would type uh, NIME AI Assistant uh, and, and you're able to add this uh, extension. As you can see, NIME has uh, uh, over 3000 something nodes. So when you install NIME, you do not install every possible node, right? You only install the default ones and then you can decide uh, which ones you want to add and also with additional panels you want to add, right? Uh, so this is in case you cannot find it, you, you need to install it. Um, so uh, I think Shantano is sharing link over Zoom and I, I will also maybe send a follow up after the event. Um, so let me go back and show you what this extension does. So there is a big disclaimer here, right? This is a chatbot and you have the opportunity to basically get help from ChatGPT to basically build uh, your analysis, right? So for example, we can, uh, there are of course many disclaimers, why? Because uh, any company employee that is using this needs to understand that they are sharing information with OpenAI, right? So that's something that is all really new and there is lots of expectations about what AI can do, but people also need to be alerted that they are sending information out, right? But anyway, uh, as part of the labs, uh, is a labs extension, means it's experimental, not ready for production, but let's see what it can do. So when you load it, it says, hi, um, I am uh, um, KI, so Nime AI, your Nime QA assistant, what would you like to know? And so for example, I can copy paste, I would like to build a decision tree model, right? Oh, I need to re-login. 
a second about that. So, yeah, it's a live demo. That's actually what happens every time. So let me try to, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll restart Nime, and in the meantime, I'll, uh, I'll show you something else. So probably is an authentication issue. Every time someone wants to use the AI assistant, needs to authenticate and I authenticated um, some time back. And now I need to authenticate again, but to save some time, I'll show you also something else. Like, as I said, labs, experimental, not ready for production, released two months ago, right? Um, so in the meantime, let me show you something else. Um, when, uh, Besides basically using the AI to get a better experience in building those workflows, you can also uh, build your own chatbot. So what this means is that uh, coming with a new uh, uh, 9.5.1, you can actually uh, uh, connect to OpenAI to basically create a chatbot using the knowledge base of your company. So Giuseppe showed you the CRISPR, the data mining, that you have this iterative process where you train your own model, right? But there is this new trend here where you can use a pre-existing model, which was actually really expensive and hard to train, and you can reuse it, right? So this is how it would look like when you use still nodes to do this, right? So the first step here is to provide your OpenAI API key. Then second, you have your OpenAI here authenticator. Then next, you would uh, basically uh, choose the model you want to use. In this case, this is GPT 3.5 Turbo. And then you can create an embedding and load a vector store. So what this means is that basically we are having all these documents of, in this case, those are YouTube transcripts of uh, educational videos of Nine, and we loaded them in as uh, a vector store uh, using uh, connecting it to these OpenAI embeddings. So those, this is basically a way to create a tool that can be used by the chatbot. When we create the agent here, we are going to basically uh, write here, you're an helpful Nine AI assistant, and this will basically explain to the AI what role it needs to cover. Then you can simply provide the tool, basically a way to retrieve uh, the context to answer the questions and an empty conversation. This is simply an empty table with no uh, information. Um, so when we basically use the agent, we just say, okay, here is uh, the conversation so far, which is empty. And here we say, a question based on the knowledge base that we provided. The question is, how can I read an Excel file? And the, below you can see the agent answering to read an Excel file, you need to use the Excel reader node, drag and drop the Excel reader and so on and so forth. How was this possible? We basically queried the uh, GP 3.5 Turbo, but before we queried, we actually use this uh, tool, right? We gave the context, right? We said, this is the conversation so far and find the question in this context. Probably here we have in the crowd, top AI expert that are maybe familiar with Langchain and these uh, tools that are now can be um, uh, combined with those AIs. But what's really nice is that, for example, you can add another agent so let me um, add another agent again, provide a conversation so far, provide again the, uh, this, uh, this model, and then we can inside here, uh, for example, ask another question, like what was the last question? And, and, and we could keep going like this by using manually the the agent in this pipeline so now it's asking again it's uh, 
sending again all this information. And as you can see, it is really similar to ChatGPT. It's saying back, the last question was, how can I read an Excel file? It remembers, right? Because we gave the conversations. So, um, of course, you wouldn't expect if this is your chatbot that you're using to do customer care, uh, you wouldn't expect your customers to use Nine to talk to your chatbot, right? That's why you would like to use this node within what we call a data app, right? So I don't have too much time to show you how you can use the view nodes and widget nodes to build in Nine a user interface. But it's, um, it's all really simple. You basically um, find uh, here, you create a component and then you can also reuse it somewhere else like I'm doing here. And then you drag and drop it inside the workflow. Um, and then it's asking me to log in again. That probably was the issue before. And so I drag and drop here the component and then I provide again here the model that I was using, we can go inside this component and find the, how the user interface was built. It's actually another workflow. If, if we go inside, you can see the refresh button widget, the string widget. But for the sake of this demonstration, all I want to show you is that if I execute now this, um, this data app, it's now basically loading a user interface on top of this node we were using. Meaning that if I open now here the view, we now have something that maybe a customer of your company can use, right? There is an adder, there is the chat history, and then we can say, who are you, right? Like, who am I talking to here? And then I can make the question, oh, let's not instead anything. And I can send a message and um, the AI will uh, basically answer back, I'm helpful and I'm assistant, right? Because we instructed it to be not just GPT, but to be the nine AI assistant, right? And it's able to provide this answer. So I understand that, you know, like you, there are many now, uh, lots of trend right now of everyone wants to build their chatbot, right? Everyone wants to use this new technology and there are many uh, problems, right? That regulations, for example, but yes, this would lower the barrier even more, right? Like, cause instead of having a JavaScript developer and a backend developer, you drag and drop, build your chatbot, you drag and drop, build your user interface, and then you can deploy and make this available via link, right? And people can use it. So it's, uh, it's part of uh, democratization of this technology. All right, um, let's see now if the, uh, I'm opening now um, a new version of Nine to re-log in for that other part. I'll, I'll be quick. So let's create a new workflow. And now let's show what I wanted to show. So we can, for example, here um, add some data like I was showing you before. And this is how you usually start. You just drag and drop some data, you execute. And this is the adult data set, another famous machine learning data set. So what I wanted to show you is that we try to make this as easy as possible, right? So you can now, for example, drag and drop. And when you do this, you're gonna have a workflow coach that you can enable to give you a recommendation. This is not AI, this is based on the usage data, right? The more people share their usage data or now they use the platform, the more this information is used to recommend the next node, all right? What I wanted to show on top is this Google uh, AI, this uh, Nine AI assistant, right? So if I can log in now here, and now we can, it should, should log back. Maybe it's the internet connection that is a bit slow. Oh, here it is. Hi, I'm Nine AI, and then I can say here, uh, how do I uh, build a uh, decision tree and make the question send. And now we have this, you know, chatbot that is created to help the nine user, right? So it's gonna tell me you need to use this node and that node. Let me close this here so it looks better. The disclaimer, you need to use the decision tree learning menu. 
can drag and drop and keep going, right? For example, you can also ask, uh, um, uh, like, uh, what are the best practices to build uh, um, a clean workflow? And again, it's asking, and then it can tell me how to write annotations and so on and so forth. So this is, again, like, like you can really follow here the AI to tell you what to do. Something even more exciting is the build part where we're gonna let the AI build the workflow for us, okay? So for example, uh, I have here, um, let's build, uh, let, I have some templates so we can save some time. I'm asking, um, I want to read the uh, Excel file. I want to filter out some columns and plot a bar chart. Also from the original data, I want to take only the first hundred rows and create a box plot. So when I do this, you're gonna see the uh, nine building the workflow. For me. So just like, it's not going to configure every node, but it should basically pull together node by node and try to perform the operation. So as you can see, he added for me the Excel reader node and the column filter node because we wanted to filter only 10 columns, then the bar chart node to visualize, the top K row filter maybe is not correct and each of them needs to be, need to be configured, right? So you need to still go through them and configure them, right? But this is still a huge help because you can just say, can you get this done for me? And you can get a first uh, uh, attempt, right? And hopefully we can make this more and more uh, correct as we go forward, right? Um, all right, I think that uh, I don't want to, we, I think we are a bit uh, over time already, so we're good? Okay, um, I'll take questions now before, you, do you think it's a, it's a good time for questioning, Giuseppe? Maybe we start with the audience uh, and uh, and then uh, we see there are some question already in the QA. Any? Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just wondering, so if you, you were talking about 9,000 components or units or whatever, so if that is the case, then, I mean, once you, you are familiar with such a tool, especially if you're developing it, you know, it, each and everything is doing, but there's always a learning curve involved in dealing with something like this. So like, what is the, if, if I just come from Python or R or some other language like that, and I'm, I'm happy, I'm, I'm doing what I want to do. Is there like a, what kind of, what kind of, is there, is there a way to easily enter to the, to the realm of this? Um. So uh, absolutely, so something I can still show quickly, but in the end, it's really similar to, I don't know, look up scikit-learn documentation, right? What is the right scikit-learn function, right? Like, of course, you, but here it's really a place where the community share nodes. And then for example, you have the same concept in Python, right? I want to use k-means, right? So you go here and look for k-means and then find the H2O nodes as well as the NIME nodes. And then you can read here the documentation and then you can drag and drop this directly into your workflow. And of course, uh, sometimes the, the chat, the, you can also ask the chat bot, right? So it's going to be, of course, not the same as you mindless code your Python really fast by not uh, missing one function if you are like that. But I think my point is, it's also not just about you, it's about who is going to use and edit and re-execute your code. Is this person familiar with Python? Maybe not, right? So in that case, you are in a large organization, you have many data analysts, data scientists, data engineers, and they want to basically uh, um, access your analysis, uh, provide suggestion, trust it, they need to trust in order to use it, right? And this is then a place where everyone can come together and visually comprehend what's going on, what, what is the output of your work.
sorry for the 20 people, 23 people online. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, if you want to make it accessible to all the all, all the non-computing people, yeah, I understand it. But what, what I'm asking is actually, like, if I just want to come here and I want to quickly enter to the, like, what are the tools and... and oh, yeah, of course. Sorry. Uh, for that, of course, we have uh, courses. So you, you can go on the NIME uh, Education uh, website and we have free self-paced courses with YouTube videos. And you can simply go uh, in the in the sequence we provide there. And also there are free certification to start with if you also want to have the badge, let's say. And you can follow them and go from beginner level to advanced and, and follow them. Then we have books also that you can, eBooks that you can download and learn. Then you can, uh, um, you can also find challenges on social media that every week there is a new challenge. You can attend my course. Yeah, of course. So like the, there is uh, both tutored, right? And uh, something on your own pace and in your own way. There is also a book by Springer, Guide to Intelligent Data Science. And that's like a generic textbook for data science master students or bachelor students. And there, there is a NIME instead of Python. So there is plenty of resources. And I would recommend looking for the learning center on, on our website and you can scroll to. Yep. What about the efficiency of the generated code? So is uh, the workflow then interpreted if you have to run it on very large data sets? I mean, how, how does it behave compared to a Python implementation of the same functions? Um, I think that like we we have got this uh, feedback about the efficiency and the, the, our developer really spend a lot of time to keep this transparency, right? Because at every given step, you can always load the table in between, right? And that's, you know, storing lots of data of intermediate steps, right? So, but the developers, uh, for example, created a new columnar backend that is much, much faster. And, and also they, provide your way to say, uh, go parallel execution on, on this step, and then you can go on different CPU threads, right? Or you can have streaming, right? That the next node start executing before the node before is done executing, right? But those are all basically ways, best practices to try to, to match. I mean, this is similar to Python packages, right? Some of them are not efficiently, some of them are. And also all those nodes sometimes are also developed by the community, right? Behind they uh, uh, run Java, but now we have also the possibility to create new nodes in Python. So in that case, there you have Python executing, so yes. You have also the possibility to control, for example, parallelism, or is this left to the execution engine? It is, there is the parallel chunk loop node, and then you can really manually, you do your own parallelization. So from the workflow. I can also add that in order to increase the efficiency of the processing through the nodes, they have, uh, in, since the beginning, introduced the constraints. The data structure is as a sequential access only. So there is no random access to the records. And that improves the efficiency also helps with big data because you do pagination. Also, we have Spark nodes, right? If you want to connect to your Spark cluster, because in the end, the uh, uh, Nymalytics platform, the real limit sometimes is the computation power of the machine, right? But if you want to connect to databases with DB nodes and, or, you know, Ive and Spark, you can also do that, right? Uh, Still, you need to execute from your own laptop, but you can send data, get data, sample data from, from the APIs. Paolo, thank you again. We need to move forward. Yeah, to yeah. Speaker, um, I'll answer in the in the chat uh, as we yes. as we go uh, to the next. And also, for the people who will stay with us, we you can talk to Paolo uh, later during the refreshment. Uh, for the people online, I'm afraid that you won't be able to do that, but. Uh, you are um, welcome to get in, in touch with us and with Paolo, with me, if you have any question. Thank you, Paolo. Okay, so the second uh, talk, the second part, uh,
let me first set up the environment share screen here. I'm happy to introduce the next speaker, which is uh, Ivan uh, Milan. And his, um, his background, uh, his first degree is uh, in gestione aziendale. And uh, then he did also a master or um, laurea magistrale in, in uh, finanza quantitativa, quantitative finances. And uh, he has been working in the banking sector for quite some time in different banks. Now he's with Sparkasse here in Bolzano. And because of his background, his interest in uh, also in data science, he has become uh, a finance uh, data scientist, I would say. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be here. And whenever you're ready, you can start your presentation. Okay, um, good evening to everybody and thanks you again for the invitation. As I already said, I'm uh, Ivan Milan and I'm a data scientist in Sparkasse since uh, 2019. Um, in that year, I also discovered uh, NIME with uh, the bank. And from them, we have done uh, several projects related uh, um, data science, but also automation, RPA, and also data quality. So um, the presentation of today is related uh, um, the last uh, project we have done, that is uh, cre the creation of a recommended system in our uh, bank. So we will see an application to our case of uh, a recommendation system using NIME. So before that, uh, uh, let's see an overview about us. Uh, Su Tiroler Sparcasse, Cassa di Risparmio di Bolzano, uh, has uh, 169 branches. Actually, they are now uh, 170 because we have just opened a new branch in uh, Bologna. Um, we have more than 300,000 customers. And in 2022, in June, uh, with the acquisition uh, of the group uh, of, of, of the stake of CV Bank, we became a group. Uh, and we can say that now we are one of the most important uh, uh, regional player in the Northeast. As you can see in the map uh, here on, uh, on the left, uh, we are now present in all the provinces in the Northeast of Italy. So this presentation is divided in three parts. Uh, the first part will be about the methodology we use to create uh, two different uh, recommendation system. The first one is a recommendation system created for communication channels. So in example, or app, or app on, or mobile app. And the second one is a recommendation system created for a CRM, so customer, so customer relationship management. Regarding the methodology, let's define what is a recommender system. So a recommender system is uh, designed to provide uh, personalized items, uh, recommendation to user based on uh, their preferences, but also behaviors. But in our case, that is a banking case, we can say also demographic features and also um, own, product, own uh, product or purchase product. So there are two very famous, very popular uh, recommendation system that are the ones used by Amazon, but also Netflix. Amazon uses a kind of association rule uh, algorithm that uh, recommend uh, to customers an item while they are buying another item. So during the purchase, as you can see here below on the left, uh, the algorithm of Amazon is suggesting, is recommending a, a cover of a phone to a customer that is buying a phone. The other uh, um, algorithm is the one used by Netflix uh, that is a collaborative filtering. You can, say that you can see it as a collaborative filtering uh, uh, algorithm that studies uh, the rating given from its user to the TV series and the movies, but also the time they spend to see these movies or TV series. And it uses this data and also demographical data to recommend new items to, to the clients. So in our case, uh, uh, in order to create these two, oh yeah, sorry. Okay. If you want, I can also stand down, so it's better for, 
maybe after I will stand down. Um, okay, so we created two these two recommender the recommender system with uh, two different algorithms. The first is the one used also by Nine, so by sorry by Amazon is the association rules algorithm that discover valuable patterns in large and sparse data set. Here is a reported an example of a, a rule we have found that says that uh, our customer that uh, own an equity fund or invest in equity fund and also belong to top client segment uh, uh, tend to purchase or own a credit card gold. So our algorithm would uh, suggest or recommend a credit card, a credit card gold uh, to the customers that uh, own uh, an equity fund or a top client and are and are uh, uh, and uh, belong to the top client segment. Uh, to evaluate the performance, we are using the lift uh, that is a general measure used in uh, in the association rules uh, models. If lift is uh, over one, it indicates as a meaningful relationship between the antecedent, the left side of the rule and the consequent, so the right side of the rule, and not a random co-occurrency. Um, regarding the second recommended system, we are using a machine learning uh, classification model, and the goal is to assign a product to, to every customer uh, we have in, uh, in the basis, uh, studying his uh, behaviors related to um, demographic data, and also the according to historical data that we will see after, that can be I can use this one, so. Uh, well, if you want to spend, okay. maybe it's, uh, I'll, I'll just, okay, just now press the. Okay, I'm very sorry. Okay, so as I was saying uh, before, um, for the second uh, algorithm, we have used a uh, machine learning classification model that has the goal to assign to every client uh, a product, uh, given his uh, preferences, but also his uh, Demograph demographical data. And for create this recommended system, we have uh, tested different models from logistic regression to uh, neural networks. So regarding the first recommendation system, it has uh, been built for uh, communication channels, I've said before. So it has to be implemented in our app, Spark on for also use a push notification and also for new newsletter and online banking. Uh, the data we used can be grouped uh, into, into type of data, uh, demographic data that are uh, the country of citizenship and the residence, the segment of the client, the job, the bank branch territory, and the age group. The products data uh, are uh, simple, simple products owned on December 2022, such as cards, but also insurances or also uh, investment products. Uh, as we have different databases, different data warehouses in uh, Sparkas, uh, we uh, aggregated and cleaned the data through the, the open source uh, software NIME. So here is an example of a NIME workflow that uses association rule learner. Uh, this workflow is very similar to our uh, real workflow. As you can see down below, below on the left, uh, the, the association rule learner is very, very let's say simple to set because uh, you have just to select the, the columns that uh, gives you all the products the customer has, but also in our case, the products plus the demographical data. And uh, it's very simple also to, to also to set the minimum support and also the minimum confidence. So just to, to see how support confidence and uh, lift work, uh, here in the left, uh, there is an example, a simple example. Uh, that uh, uses uh, five different baskets that we can see in a supermarket. Um, as you can see, the first rule that says that uh, A implies D uh, as a two over five of supports, that uh, it uh, just say that uh, the rule A uh, implies D, so the items A and D come, uh, are present in two baskets over three. It has a two over three confidence that says that in three times A appears, uh, the item D appears two times, and it has, a, it has a lift of 10 over nine. So if it's uh, over one, we can see that it has value. 
And if you compare it to the third rule, so the A implies C rule, you can see that the support and the confidence are the same, but the, the lift is different. So uh, why the lift is different? We can see that uh, the item C uh, appears in four over five basket. So uh, we can say that there is a, a co-occurrence because uh, we can see the C in a supermarket like uh, a bottle of water. Uh, so the bottle of water is uh, present in all the basket or the majority of them. So it's very difficult to create an association rules with uh, an item that compares every time. But it's different for the items A and D that as you can see uh, in three times that A uh, appears, D appears two times with him and also D appears in less baskets than, than C. So that's why the, rules one, the rule one has an higher lift than the rules three. So regarding our algorithm, uh, the training and results, uh, we implemented the association rule learner to our data. And uh, um, we have checked if these, uh, those uh, rules had a lift over one. And we also checked with the commercial domain expert and also business experts if these rules had sense in business terms. And there are reported some example of uh, rules we have found, as you can see, the first two routes are quite interesting. We have seen that uh, about our clients, uh, if they are worker and they have they are in the range of age uh, between 19 and 25, uh, they tend to own a credit card. But if they are student in the same range of age, they tend to, to own a debit card. So uh, we have checked all, the, all these routes. And we have selected some that were uh, very interesting, like this one reported that is saying that uh, uh, we have seen that uh, the client that have a, an account type A, I cannot uh, unfortunately say the, the real name of the products because of uh, policy uh, reasons. And uh, so we have seen that uh, the client that have a deposit account type A and are in a specific range of age uh, tends to own also the investment product B. So what we have done, we have, uh, they selected and extracted this kind of, of customers. And we have run a commercial campaign in, on, uh, on this customer where our, our consultant um, called them and asked them if they were interested to, to, the, to this product. And we have seen that uh, this campaign gave uh, as a redemption 26% higher respect another target that was uh, extracted by business rules. So we can see that this algorithm uh, gave us a, a real value and improved the redemption of the customer of the bank. Regarding the second uh, recommendation system that is made with a classification model, it will be used uh, and it has been used in uh, commercial campaigns and on the CRM we're implementing. As I already said, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, recommendation system is done with classification model. And the data set is very similar regarding the demographic data we use in the, the, the association rule algorithm. But regarding the accounting data, we are also considering products opened and closed in the previous six months, and also product in place, bank account balance, plus the variation, and so on. So we can see the target is different. In this case, it's a classification algorithm. So we have put as target the products bought in the following six months from the observation, excluding the renewals. And uh, we started with 473 features. After our forward, select, uh, forward feature selection, we arrived at uh, 128. And taking this forward feature selection, we also did uh, a backward feature elimination to arrive at 41 to 41 features. We have done this, uh, this uh, feature selection for all these models. So these five models, logistic regression, decision tree, random forest, gradient boosting, and also neural network. And we have chosen as optimization measure, the coins kappa, uh, that measure the proportion of prediction that cannot be correctly classified just by chance. Why did we do this? Uh, we did this because we have a lot of uh, product that were uh, um, in target, more than 25 product. So there were some product that had uh, a very, very high proportion so let's, let's think about a credit card and products that had a very, very low proportion. So let's think about uh, insurances. So that's why we have chosen this, uh, this measure. 
we have seen after uh, this optimization uh, that the best model in terms of coins kappa was uh, is two random forest. So here is uh, an example of the NIMU workflow we used. Uh, as you can see down on the left, uh, he's reported uh, the feature selection loop start that uh, it's very simple to use. You have just to select the feature target that you can, uh, with a click, decide which type of uh, feature selection you want to do. It can be a forward feature selection, but also a backward feature elimination, and also different uh, uh, selection strategy are available. On the right side, uh, there is a node called the uh, feature selection uh, filter that stores all the results done uh, in uh, during the loop and show you a rank that starts, uh, uh, a rank about uh, related the measure you have found, but the measure you, you wanted to check that is in, in this case is the coins kappa and show you all the combination of the feature related the best uh, uh, coins K. So by just a click, you can choose the best combination of uh, features. So as a conclusion, uh, the, result, the results have been uh, very satisfying for both the system we deployed. As I already said, uh, the association rules gave us a redemption related to a special investment product uh, um, more than 26% higher compared to a target not chosen by a machine learning model. And related the classification model, uh, the H2O random forest, the redemption, uh, uh, we did the same test we did for the association rules to another product that was a special pension fund. So we ran a campaign on that, as, as you can see on, on the left, uh, the result was uh, three times higher in, in terms of uh, redemption. So plus 200% compared to a target not chosen by machine learning loop model. So we can say also in this case that uh, this classification model bring real value to, to our bank. Regarding the further improvements, uh, uh, we are going to build or explore how to build uh, a data app that we can also build with time uh, in order to integrate it in our uh, informative uh, system. Uh, and it will help the consultant to recommend the best product to, to our customers. Uh, regarding the, um, re the recommendation system related the association rules, we are going to deploy it uh, in our bank, uh, in our uh, app. So we will, let's say, create a very similar recommended system like Amazon. And uh, the final uh, improvements will be related to the classification model, where we will try new models uh, uh, in, in, in order to check if they will uh, bring positive changes in terms of performance, but also redemption. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm open to, to your questions. I'm going to ask a question about the life cycles of application in bank because in my course in research is different. But in um, bank where you have uh, some deadlines, you have some constraints, when you develop such an application, how how do you plan? Is it uh, is there a specific uh, cycle you have to go through or are you able, for example, now to change the model all of a sudden? Well, this model will be updated every three months. And to deploy it, it took uh, six months uh, to deploy these two models. But we have done it with uh, um, an internship uh, girl that came as to to do the thesis with uh, with us through through the university. So I helped her to create this uh, recommendation system, and she just did it for uh, six months. So uh, usually uh, we organize ourselves. Uh, Let's say in five days uh, per week, uh, we can uh, work uh, exploring data science uh, project uh, two weeks per So 40% of our time is exploring data science project. 40 or 30% depends by how many things we have, we have to do in the week. But uh, let's say that we take now 30% of our time 
30% of my time is exploring new data science solution that can give uh, and bring us value. Should we check the online chat and see if there is any question? Um, I think this is a question for the work. All right. Um, there is a question by Stefano Mosca, but I think it's about the previous uh, uh, presentation. So maybe first, are there any questions uh, for Ivan? So maybe a detail from me that uh, escaped me is like this recommendation system, like how long did it take you uh, to deploy it? Like, deploy. To, yeah, from now to, you know, from scratch, building the workflow and then deploy all of it. It took uh, six months to, to deploy. Right. So, um, and to update, I think uh, we can update it every three months because um, I didn't mention it before, but uh, there are a lot of features that uh, um, takes the last trimester uh, variation. So we used to um, update it every three months, and it took six months to to deploy. Six, five, six months. Okay. Even because we we have done also different other other and, things, not just. And to do all of this, basically, no code was uh, required, and not even like consultants. We we have done everything hundred uh, percent in in house using Nime. Okay, well th that's so th thanks to Nime we we could do it uh, in house without coding. And because also you had experience with the other consulting situations uh, with Python and so on. Or... Yes, we had different experience with consulting uh, firms uh, regarding data science, and we have. Uh, let's say we had uh, seen some project some problems on on those projects because uh, it was very tricky for us to reverse engineering what we received so when you when you receive something in python if you're not a real coder or let's say if you also have a, a different domain that is not uh, data science it's very tricky to understand how it uh, has been done and it's very difficult to explain also to your business what uh, what this code is so with Nime is very very simple. First of all, because you can do it, uh, you know, in a, in house, and also because uh, while you're, uh, let's say, presenting what you have done, it's very simple with the visual, with the lineage, to understand even to no coder like the management can really understand what we are doing, what is the the value we we are uh, given to to our bank. So it's not just efficient in terms of resources, but it's it's also like you're more in control of. Uh maintaining the application and we, we are more in control and also we can share with us the workflow because uh, as the nodes are standard i don't have to understand what my colleagues has done and also when i'm sharing to no coders obviously maybe they are not able to to code but they can understand better how the project has been from where are coming the data where are they going and so it's very very let's say that uh, the force of nime is the not just the coding but also uh, the possibility to share and to make uh, to other people understand what you what you're doing. Exactly. Self documentation. Exactly. Self <laughs> there is a question from Frederick uh, online. He's asking why do we call it low code when uh, there was no code at all involved in this presentation? You you want to answer that or no? I mean, okay. Um, so yeah, so low code, uh, the idea is that you can, you can still code if you want, right? So there are Python script node, Java snippet node, R script nodes, JavaScript view nodes. So you can still have a little amount of snippets of codes in your workflow if you want it. So it's not like the full code, just a low code. But you could also see that when you have a workflow, that is uh, really complex, or even that has math formula nodes and uh, rule engine nodes and column expression nodes or string manipulation nodes inside those nodes or regex even, right? Like inside those nodes, you have a bit of a script that does really simple things. And then if you add loop nodes and uh, case switch nodes and all the flow control, it really feels a bit like coding, but it's still on a, 
really low level because it's it's not like uh, coding all your way through just uh, uh, a higher level of abstraction right so maybe this helps the question but to be honest these terms come and goes when i started this it was all about visual programming i don't know for you was uh, something else giuseppe I, I'd like to add something about the coding we do in NIME. So the first the first level, entry level for a beginner is to be able to build a workflow, possibly not just a pipeline, maybe a little bit more complex graph without using any coding at all. But the second level would be once you get a little bit more experience, you want to do more and you start introducing coding techniques like for loops and that... Uh, are still graphical and so it's easy to do without really knowing any syntax of coding languages, but it's programming. So it's very, very low level of uh, uh, coding experience because there are very few control structures. The th third level is when you start using what um, Paolo was mentioning, a little bit more explicit coding. So you introduce uh, snippets nodes where you have explicit Java code, R code, and uh, you can also um, uh, use variables which are shared among the nodes in the workflow. And that's a little bit more complicated because you need the programming experience. Then there is even a further level. When you start developing uh, in the programming language, you used to be only Java, but now also so Python, you create a new nine node from scratch and you add it to your base. And so you can reuse that node later on but that requires advanced programming. You need to be an expert program because you will use metaprogramming techniques which are very advanced. So with this new Python API that was released one year ago, uh, less than a year ago, so we have Harvard uh, um, Research Lab. They create a new community extension to analyze geographical data. So all these operations that you do on geographical data, right? They were able to create, I don't know how many nodes, using this uh, Python API, a decorator to say the input of the node, a decorator to say the output of the node. And I, I don't know if you're experienced Python programmers, but it, it wasn't like a, a lot of code in order to just define the inputs, the outputs, the name, the settings, and so on. And like this, they could, uh, in Python, provide a new community extension. And this is the part of the name is free and open source. They might have more and more nodes in the future, and definitely us, quite some because of this, because research labs or even companies sometimes like Continental, they decide to make new nodes and share them with the community. I mean, this is really similar with Python packages, right? Like that are new ones every day. And, and this is helping a lot with new type of techniques that come up new uh, 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 domain expertise that, you know, like uh, a single company cannot take or tackle everything, right? Yeah. How does NIME compare to LabVIEW or to the G programming language that was uh, developed by National Instruments? Because I used that tool, uh, it was in 91, uh, in a company when we were developing embedded software. And it, it, has, it has been further developed. I know it's still being used. It's quite a popular in the development environment. It's also a data flow language uh, with a sophisticated graphical interface. It looks quite similar to NIME. So are you familiar with that? Or? Uh, to be honest, it's, it, I try to keep track a bit of all these tools. Uh, it's not even exactly my role. Yeah, I was even more back then. Like, so I, I believe that there are really, really many tools that have this directed acyclic graph user interface, right? Uh, NIME uh, for the amount of people using it and the fact that it's free and open source. I don't know about this one. It, yeah, right, it's commercial, right? So like, to be honest, uh, for certain base operations, maybe there are similarities, and then maybe there is some that are really specialized on one domain, like life sciences. The really cool thing about NIME that can go in every direction and have specialized nodes to analyze molecules, and there you have, it is now a life sciences tool, right? And then you have process mining nodes I know here Bolzano is big for process mining, right? And so there is now a lab that made new nodes for process mining. And so it, it keeps growing different direction instead of just being specialized into one. And and yeah, it's yeah, it, it's free and open source. But yeah, like it's also uh, for me complex to make these tools comparisons uh, 
to be honest, right? And yeah, also if uh, if they're not, uh, uh, if they're from, do you know this tool in particular that uh, was mentioned? No, but, uh, the data flow programming, the paradigm is actually from the 70s. Oh, wow. It's yeah, very old. Oh, wow. Thank you very much, all of you, the, to the speakers, and uh, thank you for the people attending on uh, presence on the line.